Daniel was excited. Good morning, Sabbath School. For those joining us online, there's a special welcome for you. My name is Michael Hall, and I am the team facilitator for the lesson review this Sabbath. Again, welcome to the celebration uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church Sabbath School here in the Mickelson Center on the campus of Advent Health Celebration. As is our practice, we begin with one of our focal points for Sabbath School, and that is emphasis on global mission. We'll have a short video, and then we will return for our lesson study. If this is your first time, you are invited to go to the church's website and there you may download your own personal copy of the Sabbath School Quarterly. That, your Bible, and an open heart is all that is required. Join me as we watch our video emphasis. Daniel was excited to go sledding with friends. He loved sledding. Daniel watched happily as his father loaded his sled into the trunk of the car on a Sunday afternoon. The sled wasn't just any sled. Daniil had a purple snow racer. A snow racer is a sled with a raised seat, a steering wheel, and runners that look like skis on the sides. After the sled was safely in the trunk, Daniil, his parents, and friends got into the car. Before leaving, his father bowed his head and prayed, Dear God, please bless us and keep us safe. Amen. After 20 minutes, they arrived at the hill where they would go sledding. Waiting for them were more of Daniil's friends who had arrived with Uncle Sergei in another car. Daniil and his friends hit the slopes. It was fun. Daniil liked flying down the hill on his sled. He liked playing with his friends. He was happy. After two hours, the children were still having fun, but the adults were cold and tired. They said it was time to go home. The children got into the two cars, but Daniil's mother wasn't quite ready to leave. First, she wanted to take off her wet boots and put on some dry shoes. Uncle Sergei, however, didn't want to wait. We'll go home now and meet you there, he said. That way we can boil some water and have hot tea waiting for you when you arrive. Everyone liked the idea of hot tea after the cold slopes. It didn't take Daniil's mother long to change her shoes. Five minutes later, she was ready to go. Before driving away, Daniel's father prayed, Dear God, please bless us and keep us safe. Amen. The car traveled just a short distance when a scary sight greeted their eyes. Ahead was a car accident. One car had crashed into a snowbank on the roadside. Another car had smashed into the trees. Is that Uncle Sergei's car? Daniel's father asked as he reached the car in the snowbank. He got out of the car just as Uncle Sergei got out of his car in the snowbank. Are you okay? Daniel's father asked. He was fine. Everyone in the car was fine. They called for help and soon emergency workers arrived. The emergency workers had to cut open the car that had crashed into the trees in order to rescue the driver who was trapped inside. The driver of the other car had happened to be drunk and had been driving too fast in the wrong lane. He had almost hit Uncle Sergei's car head on, but Uncle Sergei had swerved off the road and into the snowbank at the last minute. Then the drunk driver lost control of his car and crashed into the trees. Daniil realized that God protected them that day. If his parents' car had been traveling behind Uncle Sergei, the drunk driver might have hit them when Uncle Sergei swerved into the snowbank. Mother stopping to change her shoes may have helped avoid a big accident. Daniel and his friends hugged each other with relief. Then they prayed. Dear God, thank you that everyone is alive and healthy, his father said. These days, Daniil always prays before traveling. I know God hears prayers, Daniel said. I have seen with my own eyes how he answers. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help open a special center where children and adults can learn about the God who hears prayers in Daniil's hometown in the Russian far north. 
Thank you for planning a generous offering. Thank you, team. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, as we follow the example of Daniel, we pray that you would so attend this part of your world, this part of your Sabbath school. Be in our midst, be there, and continue to bless the centers of influence around the world, especially there in the Euro-Asia division. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Are you ready for the question? Ready for the question. Baby boomers, listen up. What was the television entertainment host Ed Sullivan's opening line for this show every Sunday evening? The answer is, it's a really big show. The emphasis on the word show, a really big show. What really big show happened on Monday, April 8th, 2024? Slide number one. The Great Eclipse, right? The Great 2024 Eclipse. Now, what made the Great 2024 Eclipse so great? What's so great about the Great 2024 Eclipse? Eclipse. Next slide. Well, one of the things is that it was a total eclipse, a total eclipse in comparison to the three other main eclipses that we have. This is our astronomy lesson for today. And so it was gathered, gained attention, attention for that reason. You see, a total eclipse, a total solar eclipse, is when the moon passes between Earth and the sun, blocking out the bright lights of the sun. The growing, the glowing white uh, cornea can be seen just around the black edges of the darkness. And it's always accompanied with what C word? Caution. Next slide. So, the total solar eclipse happened one day, and it grew so much attention for these reasons. There were 34, I'm sorry, about 32 plus million people that live in the path of totality, as it was called. As the moon spread across beginning in, uh, at the Mexican border, it then traveled across some 15 states moving uh, northeasterly. Additionally, to those 32 million people who lived directly in the path, we noticed that there were another anywhere from about 2 million to 7 million that traveled um, to witness it, to witness this phenomena itself. And it lasted how long? Right there at the bottom of the screen, four and a half minutes. Four and a half minutes is twice as long as the one that we witnessed in 27, or 20, yeah, 2017. Astronomy lesson over. Lesson three of the Sabbath school lesson talks about light and darkness as well. Jesus introduced the great, uh, the great eternal eclipse in John 12, verse 35. That's the memory text for those following with the quarterly. Let's read or let's recite that memory text. It's up on the slide as you pull it up on your handheld device or open your quarterly. And so how, how does it read? It reads, walk while what? Yes, walk while you have the light before the darkness does what? Overtakes you or overcomes you in some version. Those who walk in the dark don't even know, don't even have a clue where they are going. Notice how Jesus introduces another dichotomy, another polemic, if you will, in the list of metaphors that we've been using to study the great controversy or the cosmic 
conflict. Lesson one, the dichotomy was what? Heaven and earth. It talked about war in heaven and then how that war got transferred to earth. Lesson two, what was the great dichotomy? Love versus selfishness. And lesson three, the great dichotomy is light versus... The central question is, how does the light and darkness concept help last-day believers, that's us, how does that help us understand the, un the great controversy, the cosmic continent, and our place in it? Big question, big event. Sunday, April 14. What synonym, what word that means the same thing does Jesus use for light and darkness? Look at John chapter 17 and verse uh, 17 and verse... Am I getting... Verse uh, 17 and verse 17, thank you. <laughs> verse 17, 17, that should have been an easy one for me. Someone want to read verse 17 of chapter 17? All right, so we see then coming, oh, there's a microphone. We'll get you on that next one. So notice uh, verse 10. Turn back to the memory text. Look at John, 7, uh, John 12 and verse 35. Notice that it said, chapter 12 and verse 35, it says that Jesus in a little while, while the light is with you, and then the last sentence that he, those who walk in darkness. So we see light and darkness in chapter 12, and then now we see in verse uh, 17 that God talks about then the place and the importance of truth. So the great synonym between light and darkness is light represents what? Truth, and darkness represents error. So truth and error are the dichotomies introduced when it comes to how do we understand, how do we make sense of the great controversy theme introduced in Revelation chapter 12, or summarized in Revelation chapter 12. What additional light and darkness metaphor, word picture, do we find in Monday's lesson? Monday's lesson introduces another set. What's another light and darkness metaphor that we see introduced there? What's the title of Monday's lesson? Savage Wolves. And when we think of wolves, what's on the other end of that uh, what's on the other end of that continuum? When we think of wolves, we often think about, we think about lambs. If wolves are savages, lambs are... Gentle, thank you. <laughs> the class is letting me know that they don't trust their teacher, that those easy questions must have a much more complex answer than that. <laughs> I've got to look at my... Uh, I've got, to, I've got to look at my pedagogy, don't I, uh, Dr. Rochelle? I've got to manage that differently. So what, in addition to uh, uh, this wolves as savages, what is it that makes this such a, befitting, such a befitting word picture, a word picture for the great controversy? Why does this convey right away some aspect of the great controversy? And the microphone. Thank you, Hazel, to Sister Barbara. There's some deception that takes place 
great controversy. Okay, yeah. So one of the reasons is that it, it conveys right away that there is uh, deception is one of the central issues. Again, what we're doing is we're backing into how is it that we make sense of what the great controversy is so that it's not just, quote, a nice Seventh-day Adventist statement, but not many people maybe have a clue about what it means. So one of the things that it conveys, one of the elements is the role of, the role of uh, deception. Anything else that you pick up that's conveyed about what makes this such a wonderful word picture, such a, such a, uh, a thoughtful word picture on uh, the great controversy? All right. also brings in from last lesson when it says that the devil comes to destroy and deceive. Mm -hmm. So it continues lesson three to tell us to be deceived is to not know truth. Yes. And so if the devil is deceiving us, he's going to be putting things that are erroneous in our path to believe what is true from what is not true. Yeah. I think my husband always hates, he always complains about the saying that they always say, my truth, your truth, and some things like multiple truths. <laughs> he's, he's, he's always annoyed when he has conversation with his patients or somebody else, and he comes home and he's so, and then studying lesson and hearing that there's no such thing as multiple truths. <laughs> there's one truth, yes. and how do we know that there's one truth? Because the Bible says it's the truth. <laughs> it comes from it. So the devil comes to not only destroy, but to deceive, and to deceive us, it makes us think that there are multiple versions of a truth yes. when it's only one. Yes, yes, thank you. Well described, well described. One final element, anyone else? Ah, no, okay. Any, one of the things that is often surprising is when we talk about war of wars, whether it's the war in heaven or war on, wars on earth, whether or not is that we often think about, again, a antagonist, someone who's against, and a protagonist, someone who's for. So we think about a dichotomy there as well. Notice what's so outstanding about this picture of this wolf in the picture. Not only deception, but that the deception works because where is the wolf in sheep's clothing located? He's in the midst of. Look at any war, and many historians, if not most, will tell you, sometimes the greatest challenge in a war are not the opponents on the other side, but the enemy from what? That the enemy from within. Second concept to hold on to when it comes to the great controversy is to recognize that even in the great war, the war that will end all wars, is the role of deception, but how deception particularly from within, and then, of course, as Sister Rochelle said, how then shall we live? How then do we live, and how do we recognize that that comes from within? So that's part of what makes it so critical. Look at Monday's lesson, and the microphone has yells on his feet, and I want to read... What does the note say? Oh, the second paragraph. We want a volunteer to read that second paragraph uh, there in Monday. Yes. We'll get Sister Barbara. His concern is that savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. In other words, believers would face fierce persecution from within the church. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so that the persecution comes within. Let's take some time and see how that is so. Give an example 
of where wolves have brought in doctrinal disharmony in the early church. Early church, meaning often is referred to as the church right after cross Christ's crucifixion through that first century, the, uh, the first 100 years or so. So that's generally referred to as the early church. Then we'll come and do the same with respect to the church down the road a ways during what's called the Protestant Reformation period, the Middle Dark Ages, loosely. And then we will talk about the same with respect to our, the Seventh-day Adventist church and our early history, the 1800s. But first, in the early church, the first century, give an example about where wolves, deception from within, brought in uh, doctrinal disharmony during that period. Who can think of one? Okay, so Sister Barbara's mouthing, uh, but not audibly, she mentions paganism, right? So what's an example of the paganism that came in early during uh, the first century, Barb? The worship of idols. Um, even the lesson says, contrary, contrary to the second commandment, idols were introduced into Christian worship for millennia Idols were in the forefront of all pagan religions to make Christianity more acceptable to heathens coming into the Christian church. Pagan deities were renamed as so-called saints. Okay, fantastic. So that's one example of how in the early church, very early on, um, disharmony was spread from within. Sometimes, as they pointed out, I think in the lesson, maybe it was in the teacher's edition, how oftentimes we think about challenges coming externally. And we'll talk about some of those externally saying, oh, uh, you Christians, of course, have it all, uh, have it all backwards. Um, we're not so sure. Uh, we definitely didn't, don't accept your Jesus. We're not even sure we agree about uh, the Father God. And we're not even prepared to discuss uh, the Holy Spirit, the third member. But we expect that externally, but from within, those challenges can come. Anyone else think of an example, um, example early on that was a challenge? How about right there in the book? Oh, sorry. And the microphone's coming up to the front. Happy Sabbath. Uh, the distortion of God's day of worship, um, Sunday worship. Yeah, yeah. As uh, very early, very, very early on, the, that was one of the marks of disharmony that came there. I think also because it's also want to appease different factions mm -hmm. right there when the Christianity was moving. So to make appease, the Jews didn't have nothing to do with Christianity. <laughs> and Christians want to spread the word as well. And of course, Constantine saw that is a good thing to amalgamate both of them and bring in idol the sun got into it to say this is such a holy day, so that is also a distortion mm -hmm. which and deceptiveness that is going on. Yeah, yeah, that's a good example. Thank you for that. Moving then from that, uh, the early church, then moving to the Middle Age church, if you will, the Protestant Reformation. Um, so what's an example of where the wolves came in and disharmony resulted. Yeah. Oh, back up to Sister Rochelle. We're talking about persecution of persons and mm -hmm. not following catath was it Catholicism or yes. something like that sort. Mm -hmm. Yes, and of course, with that being said, if you are not off the feet and doing what needs to be done, like bringing gifts mm -hmm. and all those things that is, and, and also fundamentally, the truth. The truth was in the Bible. Yeah. And of course, when the truth is removed, mm -hmm. then anything that anyone says to you becomes the truth, but it's not the truth. It's error. So yeah. that is one of the great ones that happened in that time mm -hmm. was to remove the truth from the people. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, removing the truth from the people and people not accepting persecution came along. Yeah. Wow. Excellent. Excellent point. Excellent point as well. Notice again how powerful... Um, the good intention, the intention was 
how then can we fulfill the great commission to take the gospel everywhere? And the thought was we can do it by deception, but we can also do it, the first word in Sunday's lesson is we can do it by compromise. So compromise became a strategy, a war tactic, if you will, for the side of darkness, uh, you and I would agree. And so we see how it advanced through that way. What about now moving from the Protestant Reformation to, well, let me just say one more. Uh, there was also, of course, a real struggle about whether or not uh, sola scriptura, whether or not the Bible and the Bible alone, or whether or not tradition should carry the day. Was that not the first one that Martin Luther, among the other reformers, that um, got stuck in the craw of leading religionists? Well, if the Protestant Reformation was, there are some things that are absent, have been lost in what the Bible says and how we live out Christianity. Immediately the thought was, but we've done it this way since the first century. How is it that 1300, 1400s, you all are saying we've been missing something? But we've done it this way always. Everybody knows. <laughs> and then we see that that's a major one because that's going to come up again in yet these latter days. How about in our own denominational history? What were some of the early doctrinal um, uh, disharmonies that came in very early on at our formation in the 19th century, uh, beginning, middle of the 19th century? Yes, yes. The second coming, okay? So, some say we started disharmoniously <laughs> because even as we eventually will settle and capture in our name the result of the disharmony that helped to, 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 to launch was the notion of, uh, Barbara, you mentioned it again this week uh, in, a, um, in, a, in, a, in another tech, uh, book that recently has been published, the difference between there's some general understanding that Jesus says, I will return again, Matthew 14. But whether or not it is imminent or not, and thus the context of the second coming and when, not so much what it was, but when it was, was part of the disharmony that uh, um, was part of that, uh, that role as well. And then there was the issue of expecting Jesus to come around the middle part of the 19th century, the 1840, 41, 42. And then there was, how should we be prepared? Well, we had to adopt and put on ascension robes. And so there was a group that felt we had to all dress similarly. And I picture nice choir robes and that they and so that came in, not so much that, but it was how then would we meet, whether or not everyone needed to adopt that, and then ask the question that struck some as um, heretical, how does the Bible tell us about ascension robes, and should we answer it biblically? And so we have examples even within our own denomination. Looking at Wednesday's lesson, April 17th. What additional dark and uh, light harmony do we see introduced in Wednesday's lesson? Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Barb. It talks about human reasoning and where people just thought to do what they thought was right in their own eyes, and everyone did what they wanted to do. Yes, yes, next slide. We have that today, too. Mm -hmm. Yes, and so generally that comes under the, under, the, under, the, uh, uh, under the heading of humanism, where humanism or human thought, sometimes called uh, intellectualism in, in some quarters, that that's what carries the day. That will be the ultimate decider of what is right or wrong, what is good or bad, 
what is permissible or not permissible, what is lawful or what is unlawful. And so we see then a dichotomy between humanism and scripture uh, carried the day. What's some prominent examples of where humanism attempts or uh, attempts to target or attempts to blot out the light of God's word as we see the uh, moon attempting to blot out, as it were, the sun rays from reaching planet Earth. What are some examples in our day where humanism or human thought um, is carried as supreme? Go ahead. Oh, here. Sorry. I think of evolution. <laughs> the, um, you know, that's totally against what the Bible says, mm -hmm. but so many people believe in evolution, and that's an example of human thought trying to supersede what God said. Yes, yes. Notice how the argument, we notice it and hear it in the news all the time. It's not a question that uh, the planet is billions of years old. The only question is, how do we figure out how many billions of years the cosmos has existed? Um, answering the question uh, too far off of what the original source has said. And so we're arguing billions of years, and so we're arguing one degree of error to one degree of error as carrying as truth. Any others that you see um, as, as, as well as examples of where human thought or humanism uh, blots out, carries, eclipses um, the Bible as the source? No, okay. <laughs> All right. To touch on a point of it where both theologians, historians, and so forth, um, talking about the Bible and mm -hmm. the date art. So for example, you mentioned it, carbon dating, that's dating mm -hmm. fossils, humans, anything that's organic per se. And they're saying that you have these things that are six billion years, six million years old, years old. So they're saying that it can't be possible by scholars studying the Bible that the Bible spans Genesis to generation of everything is six thousand, mm. but in fact six billion, because how can this be? Mm. So this is where we see. And so with that context, it brings into question every genealogy in the Bible. You're talking about Noah, you're talking about the ark, you're talking about when the Israelites were taken into captivity, moving from captivity and so forth. So all of that brings into question the validity of what the scripture says to what we are saying, that this is how we are doing it and this is true. And this is true, yes. Well articulated as well. Thank you for sharing that. Notice the slide in this, uh, it's from Proverbs 1625 captures it. Notice both aspects. There is a way that seems, appear, even with consensus, uh, as it were, even with the um, predominant number of, of people of the majority rules. There is a way that seems right to human beings, but the end is what? Is death or, in our case, darkness. Proverbs 1625. Next slide. So, Tuesday's lesson, and we started there earlier, talks about Jesus then proscribes the answer that the Holy Scripture is the primary great controversy strategy that protects us from the wolves and the deceptiveness that leads to certain apostasy. It is the truth. And then to the question asked, um, uh, yeah, Rochelle, you raised it. So when the question is asked, how then do we know truth? Uh, John 17, 17 tells us where. It points us to the Word of God. Right? And the Word of God always points us to John 14, verse, what's that, 2, 3. Jesus says, I am, or 6, I am the way, the truth. He doesn't say he knows truth. He doesn't say he 
has truth. He says he is truth. Meaning that truth resides in a person. And thus when we talk about truth, it is not an apology, it is not an argument about words or concepts and ideas. We are arguing for the validity of the role of Jesus as both creator and redeemer. And the components of that truth are the elements of what end up being, quote, doctrinal elements a little bit more. And so we see then that portion about how that actually happens. So the word of God. So thought or question? At the, uh, on Tuesday's lesson, it says the Bible, they argue, is the writings of kings and shepherds, of fishermen, priests, poets, and others who shared their understandings and concept and conceptions of God, of nature, and of reality the best that they, in their time and place, understood them. And I think that's one of the uh, challenges that we have today is we point to the word and we point to what God says, but there are so many people who don't believe that the Bible is true and they don't believe that the Bible is the word of God. Yes, yeah. It is a real, very, very, very big, very big, very big challenge. How then do we find in our experience of where the word of God have helped us to make a distinction between truth and between falsehood and error? Share some examples as to where, because again, those who don't know or recognize Jesus as revealed in the word, the Bible, but where we share and we can share what it has done to help us. Anyone have an example as to where uh, the word of God has helped you to uh, avoid the deceptiveness of false teachers from within or even from um, humanism or human thought from without? All right. Um, I think for me it's creation because the seven day week, when people say, well, evolution and all this stuff, I say, well, tell me where the seven day week come from. Because we have the year, we have the month, yes. and, and we can, you know, prove to like the sun and the, the moon and stuff. But where the seven day came from? Who gave us that? What culture? And people's like, well, and they don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. And then that's it. That's so it. I, I think that's the best way to, when people come or talk about evolution, is asking about where the seven day week come from. Mm -hmm. And they will be thinking about it, yes. I think, for me. Yes, yes, yeah. And it points back again, as Barbara said, to the word of God that helps us to reveal the role of Jesus in that sense that's there. Sister Vanessa. Um, for me, as a child, um, as a young child, um, I was invited to the church at around 10. And at that time, um, such low self-esteem didn't, I, I, you know, I guess preteen going through. Um, and, um, you know, come from my mom was very loving and stuff, but in me, the very low self-esteem and so forth. So when I come to a church and I'm able to read that God so loved the world and that God loved me so much that he died for me, um, that was pivotal to me. Yeah, yeah. It was pivotal to changing my whole perspective of who I was, my worth, and mm. my value. Mm. And that only came from the word, <laughs> only. Wow. wow, thank you for sharing that. What, they say there's no more powerful, uh, there's no more uh, Powerful witness. Uh, I know Elder Des in the 11 o'clock hour will speak to this, but there's no more powerful witness than how the word of God has spoke to our heart or to our soul, as Vanessa has, has, has shared. Sister Barbara? As a child, I was 12 years old, and the text that convinced me about the Sabbath, so I, and I remember to this day, is Mark 16, 1. Now, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices that they might come and anoint him. And through the Holy Spirit, <laughs> I was just convinced right then. Now, when the Sabbath was passed, and I thought, well, 
They have sat, and I was 12. Yeah. The s- Saturday is the, the Sabbath according to the Word of God. Yeah. Wow. Powerful, powerful. I'll share one. I uh, grew up in the heart of the uh, black African American community, and there was a very strong uh, Islamic uh, component in our community. And so it is not uncommon you're sitting at a traffic light for there to be a, a knocking at the door and you roll your window down and a handsomely dressed uh, minister uh, from the mosque is there with some magazines that you need to buy Muhammad Speaks. And I would look at him and so I finally got to the place I'd go home and open the Bible up and read He who has the Son has life. He who has not the Son has not life. I would read, neither is there salvation in any other, for no other name is given. I could let my window back up, and I could smile and say, thank you, brother. I have the Son. I have life. And so I'm settled because the word of God answered to my soul who Jesus is in his word. We're closing with this last slide. Hmm? Thank you. We've talked some about the total eclipse as we opened the Sabbath school lesson, looking at the total eclipse from um, April 8th. We have neighbors who would look up and ask for uh, advice about how to protect their eyes and what they should actually look for. You know, what really made it such the spectacle that it was is that that small white glow that managed to peek around the moon in spite of it blocking out most of the sun. Jesus is that corona that we can see that promises that the sun is just around the other side. So all the darkness in the world, whether it's in our personal lives or in the community, Jesus says that he has called us out of the darkness into his marvelous light. And that's what we can share with those. Not about a total eclipse that will again occur in 25 to 32 years depending on whether we're looking for a partial or a full eclipse. But there is an eternal total eclipse with the Son of God, S-O-N, shining to eclipse all darkness. I invite you to stand as we have our closing closing prayer. Our Father and our God, we do thank you from the bottom of our heart that you are the central character in the great controversy, the conflict of the uh, cosmic, cosmic conflict, the conflict of ages. That not only are you the central character, but that love outshines darkness. That you promise to be the light of the world, but our light that we then can reflect to others. Continue, we pray, to illumine us. Continue, we pray, to help us to be the light that shines in our portion of the world reflecting your glory until you come and we step inside of eternity with you, we pray in Jesus' name. And the Sabbath school that meets at celebration says, and amen. Consider yourselves dismissed.